Ooh. We're going to have church. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> so I was thinking uh, about the famous story in the, the book of Samuel about David and Goliath. You familiar with that story? David and Goliath. And what we know is that David was a part of the Israelites and Goliath was a part of the Philistines. And there was a war, and we were told historically that this person, Goliath, was like 18,000 feet tall. I mean, he was just massive, right? And no one, including King Saul in the Israelite army, army wanted to, to, to face him. Everybody was afraid. None of the finest soldiers were willing to go and to confront this, this monolithic giant except for this little small framed boy by the name of David. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> and so, as the, as the story is, is told, and that we all know if we went to Sunday school, David took the slingshot and he hurled the stone, and in one try, the, the rock hit Goliath in the forehead and down went the giant. Now, as metaphysicians, what we are always encouraged to do is to look at the archetype or to look at the metaphor behind these stories and find how it relates to you and I. And I think that this one is a powerful one and one that I hadn't really given much thought to until these last couple of weeks. And as I look at the prototype of David, David represents the infinite possibility that takes place in human form, meaning that unless we allow ourselves to step forth in front of that which we are afraid of, we will never know what we are capable of. So then what does Goliath represent? He represents the archetype of all of the obstacles, all of the excuses, all of the things that we think stand in the way of our opportunity or our breakthrough or our good. So when you think of the story, if David had not done that, then that entire army would have been paralyzed. But the fact that he was willing to do that, what, as we're told or as we, as we are led to think, there wasn't even any hesitation. He just walked out there and did his thing. And so you and I, a lot of times, I will say all the time, are given the opportunity to face what we call our Goliaths. And here's the thing that's so funny about that is we want them to go away. In other words, wouldn't life be great if they just didn't exist at all? And so we could go about our lives and we could run through fields of daisies and we could all have fresh, clean hair and nothing would ever be a problem. And yet the thing is, is that the Goliath, your Goliath, if it's a Goliath of a diagnosis, if it's a Goliath of abandonment, if it's a Goliath of paralyzing fear, if it's a Goliath of, of whatever it is that, that keeps you restricted, if you just want it to go away, then the entire beauty and the gift of the Goliath is lost. Because here's what you are called to do as the archetype of David is you are called to then go and to face that which you are afraid of so that you can see that it has no power over you other than the power that you give it. And when we start to look at those kinds of things, we can list all of those things that we have run away from. We can look at all of the times that we, like King Saul and the rest of the army, have sort of held back and waited for someone else to do it. Waited for someone else to make the mistake because we, maybe we're ashamed, maybe we're afraid, maybe we've made mistakes before and we think that that's all that we can expect. But we're here constantly reminding one another that the whole reason that we are in existence is to, as we say, prove the principle. And what is proving the principle? It's understanding that anything, anything that we perceive as an obstacle is only an obstacle to the degree that we believe that it is. Because if we say that all is God, and again, what is God? It's life itself. It's beyond description. It's the force 
of everything that is good. It is creativity. It is the intelligence that created worlds. If all is that, then what are you and I called to do repetitively, day after day, for the rest of the years in which we walk this planet? It is to recognize that. And so that means that the Goliaths then of our lives are the greatest gifts that we can be given. Because without those, how do we ever have the opportunity to prove the principle? And so I was reading this amazing quote by the writer Aurora Mountain Dreamer. Maybe some of you know her work. And you're going to want to write this down. I'm going to say it a lot, but it's probably just... Listen to me first and then let your mind go. Uh, <clears throat> the first part is this. What if the question is not why I am so infrequently the person I really want to be, but why do I so infrequently want to be the person I really am? Okay. So I'm going to repeat. So the first, the first part of what Orion Mountain Dreamer wrote was, what if the question is not why I am so infrequently the person I really want to be? In other words, why, do I, why am I always the person that's falling short of what it is that I set a goal or I can't complete the intention or I, I feel as though I'm not good enough? It's not that. It's why do I so infrequently want to be the person I really am? In other words, why do I hesitate being the David in front of the army and in front of the Goliath? Why do I hesitate being the infinite all, the vessel by which creation and all of God wants to express? Why do I continue to deny such a gift? And doesn't that then become the basic question? If you hear it, and you hear it, if you come here enough, you hear it over and over and over again that you are the vessel that you are an instrument by which the infinite wants to express. So then she says, why do I so infrequently want to be the person I really am? Why do I want to deny that? Why would anyone want to deny that? And I think it's because we have a misunderstanding of Goliath. I think it's because still at the very core of whatever the domestication is within us, we still think somehow, some way, that we are powerless to that. We still have believed in the label. We still have, have held on to whatever shred of shame that we have let define us. We still have become so seduced by our immediate world and by what we see and by what we hear that we forget. And life just becomes this, this seesaw effect of remembering and forgetting and remembering and forgetting. But the beautiful thing is that what is inside of us, I call unrest. We have this unrest within us. I call it the blessed unrest. It's the divine discontent. It's what our founder, Ernest Holmes, always would write about when he said, there is an inner propulsion inside of you that is always beckoning, always whispering, always pushing you to be a greater expression of what you think you are. And so when we look at the unrest, the blessed unrest inside of us, it's the thing that is urging you to go, that is urging me to go and stand before the Goliath that you think that you cannot master in order to give you the opportunity of what your soul has come here to achieve. And so if it was just unrest, unrest to me is not being willing to co-create with the Goliath. Unrest is, is still buying into the fact that that thing outside of us, that obstacle, has power over us. But the blessed unrest is like waking up every morning going, where's the Goliath? Where's the Goliath? Where's the thing that I fear the most? As Henry David Thoreau said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. In other words, if what you see is a Goliath that is insurmountable, then the Goliath is insurmountable. But when you look at those things through the lens of understanding that it's all God and that everything that we have, we have called to us is a gift, 
As Neil Donald Walsh always said, I have sent you nothing but angels. So in other words, Goliath is an angel. An angel brought forth in order to facilitate our growth. And what I really want you to get is that this is not some pep talk. This is not some motivational sign up for my six-week course and you'll get a new job. This is none of that. This is, this is self-inquiry. And by self-inquiry, I mean it's the thing that is calling you to continue to ask, who am I? And not just who am I, but what do I believe? Because why continue to waste energy and time thinking or entertaining the idea of infinite possibility if you're not willing to go out and to stand before the Goliaths of your world and prove it? So here's my theory on that. What have you got to lose? Because guess what? We're all going to die. <laughs> and so while we're here breathing, why not live? Because if we're so afraid of the Goliaths of our world, then we've already died inwardly inside of us. And we're just taking up space. And what I know is true for us, and I believe it with all my heart, is that there is such a vast world of experience. And it's a world that knows no age, that, know, that has no interest in your economic background, that could care less about what you did yesterday. There's a vast world out there that, to me, is an invitation. It is just one doorway after another, after another, after another. But if we become so paralyzed by the Goliaths of our world, it's as if we have stopped at the first threshold that appears to be uncomfortable. Not realizing that by stepping through that threshold, you continue from one door, from one door, from one door to the next of opportunity. It's what you're here for. So I want you to stop and think a moment about what it is that you have accepted. What you have accepted rather than what you are. And what I've come to understand firsthand that what we are truly is infinite potentiality. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, was always writing about the fact that we are expansive by nature. In Creative Mind and Success, he said, there is never a reason why a person should ever stop. In other words, stop growing, stop expanding, stop exploring. When you begin to see and understand or get a taste of that infinite potentiality, then you can begin to look at how that has no, no allegiance or loyalty whatsoever to retirement. It doesn't know what that means. What it means is that while you live, live. While you are here, explore. While you're here, understand the value and the beauty of the angel of Goliath and why it is here to serve us. So there is a distinction. There is a distinction between simple unrest, which is the agitation and the worry and the anxiety of what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen to me when I get old? Who's going to take care of me? How am I going to pay for all of this? Who's going to be around? Look at all the things that I've done for other people and no one's doing anything for me. I never get a break. All of that unrest, it's like poison that just permeates through us and percolates. And what we've come to understand about what we call law is that what you focus on just expands and expands and expands, and you get to be right. <laughs> and what's so fascinating to me is to be in conversation with people, and they understand this. They get it intellectually. And then as we're dialoguing about this, they say, but, but, you know, the big but, it's always there. And what that is, is arguing for our limitations, and we all do it. We all have a reason why we're the exception of why it won't work. So that's the unrest, that is the, the unrest of the, this earthly world. 
But the blessed unrest is what our founder, Ernest Holmes, talks about, that inner propulsion that is always calling and beckoning you to enlarge and to expand because that's who you are. That's your inherent nature. So I have to ask you point blank, where have you stopped? And consider that nothing outside of you has made you stop. The only reason why we have stopped is because we have given up somehow on a dream or an intention or we have placed that responsibility in someone else's hand and so we conveniently get to make them wrong for why our lives are not working. And what is so beautiful and why I love this teaching so much is because it's all about the personal responsibility and the power that is held within you. I'll never forget when I fully understood that. It was like somebody came along with a pair of cosmic scissors and began to cut all of the restrictive rubber bands of excuses that I had held around me why my life wouldn't work. And there is that beautiful euphoria when you realize that you are the walking, breathing freedom machine. And then that's followed by the anger and being pissed off because you can't blame anybody else anymore. (laughs) And that's the seesaw. And that's what we all go through. And here's the thing. Isn't it beautiful when you can understand that that's what's going on and still love yourself through it? That's a Goliath. When you're locked in your car and stranded on a freeway? (laughs) Think about it. Think about the beautiful collective consciousness that helped create this. But you get that we're just one speck in the microcosm and the macrocosm of all that is taking place in our world that's exactly like that, if not worse. And so what do all of those things teach us? It teaches us that we never stop growing and the opportunity for us to remember the truth of who and what we are. As she said, but why do I so infrequently want to be the person I really am? What is it about your power that scares you? And if you could only begin to create the invitation, I love this word, willing. If you could only be willing to just open the door to that power, then to the level, to the degree that the willingness is invited in is the degree in which you will get to taste it. And I tell you, when you taste it more and more and more, you begin to understand why it is that you have come here. And so in Cambodia... I had a, a large group this time, and I, uh, there's a thing that I do where I take them all to the Tanle Sop Lake, and we get on these pontoon boats, and they take us out way out into the lake, and as you're going into the lake, you start to see all of the refugees. Some of them are from Viet- most of them are from Vietnam, some of them are from Laos. It's where their country has pushed them out and over to the border into Cambodia, because they don't want them, and then the Cambodians let them in, but only so far, and these people have no resources other than to beg. And I'll just tell you, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty eye-opening sight. And as we go through there, you get, you get these mothers who are paddling in, in these small boats or in these little saucer bowls and things, and they have like six-month-old babies, and they throw the babies into the, our pontoon boat, and then they want you to give them money. And it's very uncomfortable. And some of the, the people throughout the course of these years of doing this go, why did you take me to such an awful place? And I take them to that awful place because I want them to experience the Goliath of the world. I want them to begin to see because that, that trip, that little, that little adjunct trip that we take, it seems to be the catalyst or it seems to be the, the, the wedge that begins to crack open the hearts of individuals where they understand how much they truly have. And they begin to see, they begin to see that our 
our first world Goliaths. You know, I got a bad manicure yesterday or whatever that is. <laughs> How we make them Goliaths. And if I could just show you some comparison, if I could give you just a little bit of a perspective of what is out there, then I think that this teaching or any philosophical path or any path of self-inquiry will have some deeper resonance for you. And yet you can begin to understand how blessed you are. And isn't that the key? To wake up and understand how blessed you are. Because again, if we go back to law, what does the law say? To the degree that you focus on how blessed you are is the degree in which those blessings multiply. To the degree that we are so paralyzed by our, our personalized Goliaths is the degree that our stagnation continues. And so we get to understand that it is us. It is here. And so what I see are two traits. And it's not that any of us are one trait all the time, but here are the true traits. Some of us are emulators meaning that we're looking at all these other people and we're trying to emulate who they are because we think, oh, okay, they've got it together, so let me try to carbon copy. Let me try to be who you are. Let me emulate you. And even though that might be admirable for a little bit, it's not something that's going to sustain you very far because you're losing touch with your authentic nature because you are unique. And so it isn't enough to just emulate somebody. What you are called to do is to innovate, to be an innovator. Not an emulator, but an innovator. Meaning that when you wake up to the potentiality of who you are, you get to innovate the way in which you're going to express that. And you, can you imagine, can you imagine a collective of innovators? Can you imagine the power behind that? Can you see the beauty behind that? When everybody is operating from oneness but not sameness. And you get the power and the potentiality of what it means to be an innovator as you walk through this world. And so my prayer, my, my, um, my constant affirmative knowing is that people who walk through the doors of this building somehow without even realizing why suddenly are reawakened to their innovation, to why they get up in the morning, to why they want to be activated into this world. Every single time I walk into this building, whether it's on Sundays or during the days of the week, I, just, I have this thing, I touch the door, and I bless that door, and I set the intention of that door that somehow something gets through not just the intellect, but down and migrates to the heart. So that the people understand. And what I believe, I believe, I believe in the ripple effect. I believe that when one gets it, somebody else gets it, and somebody else gets it, and somebody else gets it, and somebody else gets it. And, else gets it. and so that's my prayer of knowing for you.